Hello. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is probably the most misunderstood concept of Christianity that I have uh, noticed in my past nine years with Christ. Uh, listening to Christians uh, in person, uh, online, and through sermons and preaching and teaching from uh, various churches and denominations. I think it's pretty important uh, to pay attention to this uh, study, uh, which is called the Gospel of the Kingdom of God. In Matthew 24, 14, and I hope you have a Bible near you that you could look up the scripture as I uh, recite it, or maybe if you're near a computer, you could look them up online or have a Bible program in Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. It says preached to all the nations until the end come. What is it preached? What is it that's being preached? The kingdom of Jesus Christ or the gospel of the kingdom. In Revelation 14.6, Revelation 14.6, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, the everlasting gospel, to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, kindred, and tongue, and people. It says everlasting gospel, means no end at all times. No additional gospel needed. Paul said in Galatians 1, 8, But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you, than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. You think Paul was angry that another gospel was being preached? I think so. In Acts 20, 24 and 25, Acts 20, 24 and 25, Paul says, but none of these things move me, neither can I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Notice what he said, the gospel of the grace of God. Now what does he say next in verse 25? And now behold, I know that you all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. Synonymous. Gospel of grace, gospel of the kingdom. It's the same. Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom. So did Paul and all the rest of the apostles. There are no two gospels. There can only be one. In Daniel 2.44, going back to the Old Testament, it says, in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven, the God of heaven, set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. Kingdom forever. That was a prophecy in Daniel. That's what Jesus did when he came to establish his kingdom. It was a kingdom forever. Is there a mention of a thousand year reign here? No. Jesus never spoke of a thousand year reign. It says in, in the scriptures that I've just read so far, it's an everlasting kingdom. Uh, but notice how it says the God of heaven sets up a kingdom, which equates to kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. And that's where it originates from heaven. Daniel wrote to the Jews. And it shows that God wanted to do this, establish a kingdom from the get-go. In Mark 1.14 and 115, Mark 1.14 and 115, now after John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus preached. We just noticed that Paul preached the kingdom of God too in Acts 20.25. 20, what did he say in uh, Mark 1.15? Time is fulfilled. The Old Testament scripture is fulfilled. 
and the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is at hand. What must you do? Repent and believe the gospel. That equals what Matthew said in Matthew 3, 2, saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, they're synonymous. They mean the same thing. Now, after Jesus' resurrection, we see in Acts 1, 6, the disciples asked him, this is after the resurrection, after the cross and resurrection. When they therefore were come together, they asked him saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? That's what every Jew that was growing up in those days was waiting for, the Messiah to come and establish a kingdom. We know that the majority of them missed the point. We'll go over this soon. Uh, the closing passages of the book of Acts, this really would seal the deal for anyone. In Acts 28, 30 and 31. Acts 28, 30 and 31. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came into him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidden him. So he taught about Jesus, the life of Jesus, and the kingdom of God. That's what Paul was doing. If you think Paul brought another gospel, all of you guys, the mid-Acts people, it doesn't seem it doesn't seem so. He was preaching the kingdom of God. He was preaching Jesus, right? John the Baptist came preaching the kingdom of God is at hand. It's coming. Jesus preached the kingdom of God is here. Obviously, so did Paul and the rest of the apostles. They preached the kingdom of God. When Jesus spent 40 days after the resurrection, it says he was teaching them everything pertaining the kingdom of God, even after the resurrection. In Revelation 3.21, To him that overcometh, to him that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me in my throne. This is written 2,000 years ago. Meaning, Jesus was a king 2,000 years ago. That's what he is. It says that Jesus was already ruling and reigning. That's what he promised. To, to whomever overcometh, he would come sit next to me on the throne. Jesus is king from 2,000 years ago. He'd been ruling and reigning ever since he came. See, the last thing the disciples asked Jesus before he ascended was about restoring the kingdom. They understood the concept of the Messiah coming to establish the kingdom. See? And it all started back in the Old Testament in Exodus 19.5. And you need to read the scripture and, and meditate on it. This is before they went into the promised land. It says in Exodus 19, 5 and 6. Now, therefore, if you will, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar people, special people, set apart people or treasure unto me above all other people. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests. You shall be those who obey me, God is saying, you will be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. See, God, God wanted to establish a kingdom from the get-go. He wanted special people for him, for himself as a king, subject to the king. And the plan never changed. A kingdom, and, and the problem is we're not accustomed to kingdoms these days the past hundred years or two hundred years but throughout all the the past five thousand plus years they've been emperors kings and you must obey the king but we don't understand the cause the concept of kingdom anymore a kingdom the qualification for god's kingdom is for him to be a king over his people it's that simple so if you're calling jesus king 
and you're the subject, you're, you're a citizen of that kingdom, uh, what is it that he wants you to do? Right? See, a relationship between the king and his people that had a condition, if you, if you obey, there has never been any covenant or this type of relationship without a condition. There's got to be a condition. And he said in Exodus 19.5, if you obey my word. That's what God wanted. He wanted to make a covenant with the Jews when he took them out of Egypt. So if you notice, from the time of Moses to Samuel, they were a nation without an earthly king. God was their king. God was their king. But in Judges 8, things started to change. When Gideon won his battle, uh, the Jews took him aside and says, Why don't you and your sons rule over us? It says in Samuel 8.4, Then the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah. That's the first time was in Judges. Of course, Gideon refused. Now they come to Samuel. They said unto him in Samuel 8.5, Samuel, 1 Samuel 8, 5. Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in the ways of God. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. They wanted an earthly king. They no longer wanted God as their king. So, uh, uh, of course, Saul became a king, and then he didn't fulfill his duty as a king according to God God gave them David uh, and, 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 and he promised to build a house meaning a dynasty in Samuel 2 Samuel 7 12 when the days be fulfilled and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers he's telling David I will set up thy seed after thee who's the seed Jesus Christ Paul explains that in Galatians 316 which shall proceed out of thy bowels and I will establish his kingdom meaning the Messiah that's coming from the loins of David from a descendant of David will establish a kingdom did Jesus come the first time yes and he established his kingdom um, now notice how he established a kingdom for and will rule forever it says and there have been hundreds of, prophet, of prophecies like this that prophesy about the kingdom and restoring the kingdom. It's throughout all the Old Testament. That's why any Jew growing up in those days understood the concept of the coming Messiah as a king. <laughs> now, the problem with the 200-year uh, new theology called dispensationalism missed the point. That, and they say that the Jews wanted to make Jesus a political kingdom, but he rejected. Or they, they wanted Jesus, uh, they rejected Jesus as their Messiah. Now, in John 6.15, it says the, quite the opposite. John 6.15, when Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force and make him king. They wanted to make him an earthly king. He departed again into a mountain himself alone. They wanted to make him a king. But not he didn't come to be a king like they wanted him. Not an earthly king. Jesus never came to establish a political kingdom. Nor establish a thousand year reign. Especially when he never talked about it. Jesus never ever gave any instructions about a thousand year reign. Never. Never talked about it. He came to establish a spiritual kingdom. Just like in Matthew eleven twenty eight explains it. Matthew eleven, sorry, Matthew twelve twenty eight. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Meaning the kingdom is here. In Luke seventeen, twenty and twenty one, and I use this in previous studies. When, the, when they were demanding, the Pharisees demanded Jesus when the kingdom should come. Everybody understood, including the Pharisees. They knew about the kingdom coming. 
He answered and said to them, The kingdom of God does not come with observation, neither shall they say, Lo, here or there. Behold, the kingdom of God is within you, within the believers. The kingdom of God has arrived, Jesus said. It's in the believers, within you, in the midst of you. Who, who is you? The ones who obey him, the disciples. In John 18, 36, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servant fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now is my kingdom not from hence. The kingdom was in this world, but not of it. Despite what the dispensationalists and the hyper-dispensationalists say, they're wrong, and they need to read this scripture. And by the way, the reason I mention dispensationalism is because 85% of Christianity, churches, seminary, uh, the Bible colleges, they all teach opposing to what this scripture says. Jesus told Nicodemus, you are a teacher of Israel, and you don't know that you must be born again? You must be born of the Spirit. That's the teacher of Israel. To enter into the kingdom, you must be born again. What What do you do to get born again of the Spirit? Repent and believe, King Jesus. Then you enter the kingdom. As soon as that happened, you enter the kingdom. It's not a future thing. Yes, we await His kingdom to come from heaven. But you already enter the kingdom if you're born again. Because you're calling Jesus Lord, right? Lord, Master, King. So what is your position as a subject to the King? What must you do? And in the next teaching, I will show you that so many people have responded to the wrong gospel. Now, only God is the examiner of the hearts. But if you don't know what the gospel is that you believe in, then you must re-examine your faith and you walk with God. When the Jews went complaining to Caesar that Jesus was a king rival to Caesar because Jesus was asking them to obey him. That's the definition of a king or a master or a ruler. Unfortunately, like I said, these days they don't understand when they call Jesus Lord or king, they don't understand the concept that you must obey what he says, everything that he says. After all, he is the king, isn't he? You're either slaves to sin or you're slave to the king. And in Romans 14, 17, one of my favorite passages in the New Testament. For the kingdom of God is not meat, drink, but righteousness, peace, joy of the Holy Ghost. Um, righteousness and peace and joy and justice. Do you have that in the world now? But you have it in Jesus' kingdom. It's a spiritual kingdom. Not a political kingdom as the dispensationalists describe it. In Acts 17.30, Acts 17.30, And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. That's the first step. Repent. Change your ways. Realize that you're a sinner in need of a Savior. Acts 17.31, Because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness, but that man whom he had ordained, wherefore he had given assurance unto all men in that he had raised him from the dead. That's the ultimatum. Read this on your own again, Acts 17, 30 and 31. That's the ultimatum, is to repent and believe or suffer the judgment or the consequences. It's that simple. That's how you respond to the message of the gospel. In the parable of the wedding, uh, the wedding feast in Matthew 22. And I don't know why Christians don't need this, don't read it, or maybe when they read it, they think automatically that this is at the end times. But it, the invitation was for you then when you read it. Read the parable, Matthew 22. You have to come as commanded. It means to be committed to Jesus, to be saved. In other words, he has to be your king. See, the king in that parable was uh, uh, making a, a, son, uh, his, uh, a wedding for his son. And he sent in his servants to invite the people, the Jews first. And they made excuses. I have a field to till. 
I'm busy with my wife, I'm busy doing this. So he said, go out to the highways and byways and invite, that's the Gentiles. The invitation was extended to the rest of the world. You see, and you see at the end of the parable, one was not clothed in the way he should have been, as he commanded the king, in the wedding. So what, what happened to him? He was a done deal. He was thrown out in the, in the, in the outer darkness. Yes, he's, you commanded to come dressed in white robes in Jesus' righteousness. So that's the gospel of the kingdom that people need to understand this concept. It's very important to understand that. And the next teaching, uh, I will talk about what is the gospel of Jesus Christ? What is the gospel? There's also another teaching that about the response. How do you respond to the gospel? Because I, I have a feeling from talking to so many Christians after nine years, it seems like they didn't get the message. How do you respond to the gospel? And what is the gospel? Because if it's the gospel that saves you, you better know what this gospel is. Okay? All right. Sorry it's taking me so long to get back online here, but... Uh, I hope uh, you listen to this study and the next one because they're very important. God bless.